Hi, I'm Greg Williams, Deputy Global Editorial Director of Wired. And I'm here today to talk with Sara Saeed. Sara is a clinician and an entrepreneur and a technologist. And we're going to be talking about her e-health platform, uh, Sehat Kahani, which she's built in Pakistan. So if we can start with an overview of the healthcare system in Pakistan, why was this a challenge that you wanted to take on? Um, so Pakistan has a population of roughly 240 million people. It's the fifth largest country in the world. And to cater to that, we have 240,000 doctors. So if you do the math here, that's one doctor for 1,000 patients. There's another interesting phenomenon in Pakistan that middle-class parents, when they have money to educate their daughters, they want them to become doctors. Mm -hmm. Because being a female doctor in Pakistan raises your social stature, makes you more noble. Um, so out of these 240,000 doctors, 80% are women. They graduate, but they never practice. Because by the time a female doctor becomes a doctor and she starts practicing, that's when the social and cultural barriers kick in. You either get married or you have children or you're not allowed to work. So a lot of these women come out of the workforce. Um, so 40% of our 80% doctors never work. The term for these doctors, these female doctors who do not work in Pakistan is called a doctor bride. Because if you're tall, if you're fair, if you're thin, and if you're a doctor, you get the best hand in marriage in our country. What I saw as I was graduating out of medical college is a lot of my peers started getting married, mm -hmm. having children, and started leaving the force. There in the medical ward, I saw a lot of patients who came to the hospital to die comfortably. And that's where this irony actually struck, that I'm in a medical school with so many women doctors, and then I'm a hospital with people coming to die because they did not get a doctor in their community. And I continued my career. I started doing my first year of residency in radiology, but I had to quit because I got pregnant. And in my pregnancy, just to kill time, I started doing a primary care clinic in a slum. And when I started practicing in that slum, and that slum was in the center of the city, but yet women and children, because of the conservative nature of that community, weren't allowed to go out to a tertiary care hospital. So I really saw how a doctor, when it's in the community, can actually impact a lot of patients around her. So I had a wonderful time. And when I landed in Lahore, which is another city I was based in, then I actually felt that I had become the doctor bride. Uh, I fell into postpartum depression. I couldn't work. I couldn't leave my child alone. And in that time, the nurse that was working with me in the clinic, in my primary care clinic in the slum, called me. And she said that, you know, we, we don't have you. And patients are asking me, where is the doctor gone? And they need a doctor in this community. And we started doing video calls. And that's when I realized, OK, Pakistan has two major problems. Female doctors not working, patients not getting doctors. Just connect them through the bridge of technology. And that is exactly how Sehat Kahani was born, that a network of female doctors providing consultations all across the country and even globally using telemedicine. So one of um, uh, the most powerful uh, partnerships that I've had over the years while building Sehat Kahani has been the Rolex Perpetual Planet Initiative. And the reason for that is not a lot of people in Pakistan know about um, Rolex or the Rolex Award for Enterprise. When I applied for it and when I got, uh, when I was named the Associate Laureate for Rolex Award for Enterprise and I came back to Pakistan, it helped me in two ways. So A, we were able to use the funding support to create an online learning management system. But on a broader perspective, I think when I came back as an associate laureate for the Rolex Award for Enterprise, I think my credibility as a female founder increased. Uh, people placed more weight behind what I was saying. Even as I talk today in big rooms such as government rooms or bureaucrats, um, and even today when I speak somewhere or when I'm given the opportunity to talk about something, I think the initiative uh, that I'm backed with gives me a lot of credibility and exposure. So what have been the biggest sort of like obstacles you've overcome? Are they the technological obstacles you've overcome or are they the cultural obstacles? I think both external and internal obstacles. Um, so external obstacles is before COVID, uh, before 2020, just making people understand that an online qualified doctor is better than a physical quack. I think that was a big problem. Mm. Um, we were two female doctors who had run, who had created a company with no background or professional experience. So people making people understand that we had the business acumen and the entrepreneurial courage to lay this platform and kind of promote it all across Pakistan was another challenge. Uh, but I think the most important challenge was, and as, as I said previously, was creating people's trust on the service. 
and breaking down the myth that you can't talk to a patient. It's not a consultation if you can't talk to a patient in person. That was the that was the underlying myth that we had to break right. down. And once we were able to do it with continuous education, counseling, a lot of mobilization. So not all conditions can be diagnosed online. How do you work to ensure the correct diagnosis when you know you need to examine someone physically? So because we had data for the last uh, three to four years, we were able to filter out uh, the most popular symptoms that patients came in in our clinics. Uh, but pretty much, I think, um, primary healthcare system in Pakistan is centered around 28 to 30 diseases, which is what we cater to. And can you tell us a little bit about the conditions that you're seeing where you feel you can have the biggest impact and really drive change? So that's extremely interesting because when we started, uh, the feedback that we got from the communities was um, a lot of women will not feel comfortable coming into our clinics because it's an online clinic. Uh, but now, 90% of the footfall that we have in our clinics is women and children. So we get a lot of women and child healthcare diseases. We actually incentivize women for coming in for their um, pre pre labor, in labor, and post labor labor visits. Um, so if they complete four visits of their pregnancy, we incentivize them. Um, then we have di diabetes, hypertension, we have dermatological issues, we have all kinds of infections coming in, and mental health issues. Um, so we trained all our nurses to become first aid responders of mental health, mm. and we hired psychologists and psychiatrists, so we get a lot of mental health issues as well. So you're obviously having a significant impact in terms of, of, of health care. Do you think you're also driving social change as well? Absolutely. I think. Every, every clinic that we open, there is a nurse who is in that clinic. Um, what we tell her is, you're doing a great job, but if we come in, we're going to double your income. So you're going to get more patients. So we're also able to socially empower them and financially empower them. And how do you think of yourself? Do you think of yourself as a technologist, or an entrepreneur, or a clinician? So I think I'm a doctor turned entrepreneur. Uh, I had no formal education in business or technology, but I've really learned my way through. I think what's what's kept me motivated and and uh, and it has helped me to kind of take my way through this business is when, when I saw patients getting healed on the application. Because in the end, it is as simple as getting a doctor to talk to a patient, right? That's what we're all enabling. At the bottom of this, I think I'm a medical doctor who just sees the value of primary health care, who sees how it impacts people and changes the quality of life. I'm also a daughter who saw 20 years of my life being impacted by heart disease. And if my father had known about his problem 10 years earlier, if he had a Sehat Kahani app, I think things would have been very different for him now. So I think I see, really see the value of primary health care changing the quality of life of a patient by giving them an opportunity to live the, to their maximum potential. And I think that's what I am at the end of it. Uh, just a doctor who wants to see patients living fully and completely. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been fascinating hearing the story of Sehat Kahani. Thank you. Thank you.